Good morning and welcome to Gold Hill Online. My name is Stephen and I'm one of the pastors at Gold Hill and Hope Church. Last week we had a day of new beginnings, last Sunday a day of new beginnings where we turned back to God and brought him some of the things that we wanted to get rid of in our, in our lives and in our church life so that he could move more fully and flow more freely in us and through us as we tried to pastor not just the church but also our community. This week we've also seen some new beginnings or, or uh, reopenings of certain things. We reopened the church for private prayer on Tuesday and on Thursday this week. On Thursday and Friday we reopened the bread house and Unique Like You, a new beginning there as uh, we have a place in the middle of the high street to have uh, tea and coffee and cake and to share something of God's love with the people that go there. Today, this Sunday, marks uh, the first day of my new role as interim pastor team leader in the church. And a few of the trustees uh, got together with me to pray uh, for me as I start that role. God our Father, we raise Stephen to you as he's made himself available to you and available for your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you'd bless and anoint him in the work that he's been called to do. Give him strength and success in all he does. May he know great blessing and may we as the people he's leading also know great blessing in all that we do. May we see your kingdom grow. May we see your kingdom come on earth for the glory of your name. Amen. Heavenly Father, uh, we want to praise you and thank you for the journey that our church has been on. We thank you that Stephen is willing to stand in for this time to be uh, your person. We pray for Nikki too, as she supports Stephen, as she looks after the family. Would you bring blessing to them? We do pray for Stephen particularly that you would give him great wisdom to know when to go and when to move, when to speak and when to be quiet. May he know the heartbeat of Christ in all that he does and says for your people here in Chance and Peter. Not just the church, but the wider community, Father. We want to reach out as a church uh, to reveal Christ to people that have ignored you or don't know you. So we ask, Stephen, that you would be secure in your faith, that you would be strong in the words that you use, declaring that Jesus Christ is Saviour and Lord to all who are willing to hear. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As the trustees prayed for me, and as we prayed for, for Fiona and Susan on Thursday morning, I want to pray for us as a church family. As we um, pastor each other and we, we love one another with God's love and, and point each other to Jesus, but also as we reach out to the community that, that we live in and the communities that we represent and try to reach them with God's love as well. So let's pray before I hand over to Ben and Abby, who are leading us in worship this morning. Jesus, we thank you that your love is great. Thank you that you are Lord of all. Thank you for the people uh, engaging in church online this morning, whether they know you well or are getting to know you and exploring who you are. Thank you for the seeker and the seasoned follower. Thank you, God, that you welcome both. And we welcome them as well. Jesus, I pray that uh, we will know your love, the greatness of your love, awakening us, exciting us as we care for one another, but also we care for our village, care for our community. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would awaken us, would um, enliven us and excite us as we care for one another, as we uh, pastor one another, but also as we care for the village and community and, and pastor them and reach out to them with your good news. Jesus, I pray that as we look at your word later on in this service, as we open the Bible together, that that will be a central part of who we are and that we will awaken ourselves um, to what your word is saying and what you're saying to us through your word. And that as we um, live with each other, as we uh, are church together, that you would encourage us to, to um, 
encourage one another in your word, but also that we would be sharers of your words as we reach out to the community. Lead us by your Holy Spirit in this service. Awaken us with your great love. In the name of the Father God who loves us, the Son, Jesus, who came and showed us what you're like, God, and the Holy Spirit who brings us close to God. Amen. Go for it, Ben and Abby. By the cross you came and broke them down, you broke them down. There were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life I'm back to life Hear the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, what a love we found, death can hold us down, we'll shout it out, we're alive. You're alive and what a love we found Death can hold us down We shout it out We're alive Cause you're alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. comes 
like her from love comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Surrender my 
Jesus, we are still in your presence. We're pausing. 
recognizing, God, that in a, a mysterious but wonderful way, you are here with us as we meet online. Jesus, I thank you that you speak when we open the Bible. And I thank you, God, that we are Bible people. And as Dave um, brings us a, a, pass, a, a message today from Jonah 4, Jonah chapter 4, God, I pray that uh, we'll hear his voice, but we'll hear you speak to us and help us to do what you are asking us to do, to be what you're asking us to be as a result of, of meeting with you this morning. Amen. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name's Dave, and I'm part of the leadership team at Gold Hill. And today, it's my pleasure to be able to share with you a little bit from the Bible as we finish off a little series we've been doing called Big Fish, Bigger God, looking at the life of Jonah and looking at what he got up to. Today, we get to the end of the story, and it's the slightly strange ending. It's the least famous bit of the story, and it's the kind of strange thing that happens after you think the story has ended. But just to make sure that we're all up to speed and we know where we're up to in the story, I want to remind us of that. Now, we're finishing uh, where I started, sat at my dining table, and I want to visually remind us of the story. I've done this before, but we're going to build on it a little bit today. So, the story of Jonah. This is our Jonah, and Jonah was in Jerusalem. Now, God spoke to Jonah and said to him that I want you to go to the people of Nineveh. We'll make this our Nineveh. Now, uh, the people of Nineveh were not very nice people. They were very scary people. They did lots of unkind and unthinkable things to different people. And so Jonah didn't want to go there. So instead of going to Jonah, he uh, went along and he got on a boat. And on this boat, he headed towards a place called Tarshish, which was far away from Nineveh. So he's, he's hopped on his boat and he's traveling that direction. Then the most famous bit of the story happens, which is a fish comes along and the fish eats Jonah. This isn't to scale, so it's going to be difficult to do this. In fact, none of this is to scale, let's be honest. Um, so uh, the, the, the fish eats Jonah and for three days, Jonah is in the belly of the fish and he prays and he turns back to God and he declares how sorry he is that he's turned away from him, that he's run after all kinds of different things that aren't God. And God hears that prayer and forgives him and the Jonah and, and then uh, the, the fish chucks Jonah out onto the land again and Jonah is once again spoken to by God and he has a choice to make. He has a choice about whether he will now go to the people of Nineveh and he does and last week Stephen helped us to explore that powerful powerful uh, message of the people of Nineveh hearing and responding and turning back to God. Now, it's a good thing that the, that the people of Nineveh have, have turned back to God, and you'd think that this would be the end of the story, that this would be exciting. You'd think that Jonah would be thinking, this is fantastic, I've finally done what God said, and I've finally uh, had, a, had, a, had a victory, and everything is going well, and, and that'll be the end of the story. And maybe part two of Jonah, Jonah chapter two, the, the, the second in, in the film franchise, would be about Jonah receiving another message from God and going somewhere new. Or maybe it would be about the people of Nineveh uh, and, and the new life that they're living. But, but no, the final bit of this story, the epilogue of this story is very different. You'd expect Jonah to be on top of the world, to be on cloud nine. He'd finally done what God said. It had worked and that would be a good thing. But no. This final bit of the story, which we're going to read, is actually summed up like this. Jonah is in a big sulk, but there's still a bigger God. So Jonah is not very pleased at all. In fact, let me read the beginning of the final chapter of Jonah. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I know that you're gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better to, for me to die than to live. Jonah is having a major sulk. He's having a big dramatic moment. I'd rather be dead than in this situation, he says. He's having a sulk because to him it seems very wrong that God has been willing to forgive the people of Nineveh. He is not happy about it at all. He's sat there. And he's watching and he's going, this should not be the case. To him, it just doesn't feel fair. To him, it seems unjust. I remember when I was a child and I was in uh, year one, I think. So I was very young, about five or six. And we were learning about different letters of the alphabet. And I remember uh, we, we were looking at the letter U. And our teacher was asking us, 
can anyone tell us, uh, tell me a word that begins with the letter U? Now, our teacher had been getting quite frustrated with us because quite often she would ask us questions and people would put their hand up and she would say, yes, do you know the answer? And they would say, oh, um, um, uh, I don't know, I've forgotten. And she was getting quite frustrated by this. And so she was on a bit of a, a, bit of a drive to get us to make sure that we knew what we were going to say before we put our hands up, as a good teacher does, sort of teaches you some of those lessons about life. So I'm there and I've been asked to think of a, a word beginning with the letter U and I think to myself, I've got quite a clever one. So I put up my hand and the teacher calls on me and I say in a big clear voice, um, and the teacher told me off for not knowing what I was going to say before I put my hand up because I said, um, and she thought I didn't know what I was going to say. And I remember it was, a, it was an early memory of mine and it's the first time that I remember feeling that sense of injustice. I'd done something that was right, that was correct, that was actually, in my mind at least, quite clever. And I'd been told off for it. That's wrong. That's not okay. That's, that's not how it should be. It was wrong. It was unjust. It was unfair. I remember it quite, quite, quite vividly, probably because those early memories where you discover a new emotion kind of stick with you. Jonah was experiencing in this moment that feeling of it's not fair. And he has a sulk. He has a strop. He has a, he has a whinge at God. And I want to look at what God does in response. And actually, the course of the rest of this message is kind of caught up with two parables. What I want to share with you is all about two different parables. The first, something that happened to Jonah, and the second, something else, which I think is quite similar that Jesus shared. So let's look at what God did in response to Jonah, who's had enough, who's having a strop. Let's carry on reading. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is what God does in response to Jonah. He, he leads him through a little story. I said this was a, a, a parable. This is the parable of the leaf. And in this, in this parable, which, which Jonah gets to live out, which God does around him to, to help him understand and to help him grow and to move on, what we see is that Jonah starts in this place where Jonah is having a right old sulk. And in fact, he's, he's gone out and, and, and the people of Nineveh are here and he's gone and he's just sat and he's watching them. He's watching them because he wants to see what will happen. He wants to see if God really is going to forgive them. He wants to see if, if God is going to turn back and actually will punish them in the end after all and they'll get what they really deserve, that the right thing will really happen. And so he sat there watching. And then uh, God uh, provides, and again, as I said, this is not in any way to scale, but God provides a big leafy plant. And this big plant comes and it shades Jonah and he's feeling wonderful and he's feeling protected and he's feeling comfortable and he's feeling soothed. Hot place, of, hot, hot part of the world that he was in, but he had this, th th this shade and it was, it was good. And then God, uh, God makes the next thing happen. And he comes along uh, and he provides a, provides a worm. Now, I'll be honest, this is just the, the fish from before, but if you turn it on its side and wiggle it, it looks like a worm. So he's, he, he's brought this worm, and what the worm does is, again, not to scale, he eats the plant. And now the plant is gone. And now Jonah is, is, in, is in, the, in this hot part of the world, and, and, and he's again feeling very, very, very uncomfortable. And he's really upset, and God goes even further, in fact. In fact, he provides, he provides extra heat. He provides heat by, 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 by when, the, uh, when, when the sun comes up, he then provides a lot of wind and, uh, and it's even hotter. And so instead of having a nice bit of shade that's provided by this leafy plant, Jonah is actually getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And he's upset about it and he doesn't like it. 
and he's feeling uncomfortable and he's feeling hot and he's feeling sticky and he's feeling grumpy and he's feeling angry and he explodes again with it's not fair I'd rather be dead than alive in this situation this is what Jonah lives out this is the parable that God enacts around him so that he can teach him a lesson but what is it what is it that Jonah is meant to learn from this what can we see in the person of Jonah throughout this story well the first thing that I think we see is that Jonah really likes comfort. He likes to be comfortable. He likes to be at ease. He likes things to be exactly how he wants them to be. He likes that physically. He likes that when there's that plant and he's feeling covered and he's feeling shade and he's feeling comfortable. He's not feeling hot and sticky and sweaty. He likes that. But he also likes the kind of comfort that is about not having to be pushed out of, outside of what he wants. He doesn't like these people. He hates the Ninevites and he wants to see them destroyed. They've not been. They've been forgiven and he finds that uncomfortable. He wants things to be fair, but not anyone else's view of fair, his view of fair. He wants things to be the way that he wants them to be. And so he's upset that God has actually been loving and kind and merciful and compassionate. You know, all of those things that we want God to be to ourselves, but not necessarily to other people. Or at least that's the way it was for Jonah. So Jonah likes to be comfortable. He doesn't like to be pushed and stretched. But there's another thing that we see, which is that for Jonah... It was all about him. For Jonah, he made this whole thing about him. God points out there are 120,000 people, plus all of these animals in Nineveh, and something massive has happened in their life. But for Jonah, it's not about them. For Jonah, it's all about him. Jonah is at the very centre of Jonah's life, and he doesn't want anyone else to take that place. It's all about him. He's very good at making every situation that's going on around him about himself. And the final thing we see about Jonah is that he is a massive hypocrite. He's being so hypocritical in this. He is angry because these people who are far from God and didn't do as God wanted, even though they've turned from him, he's angry that they've been forgiven. Well, we've got to remember the previous bit of the story. How did this story start? Jonah. Go here and Jonah instead tries to come all the way over to here. And it's only when that whole thing with the fish happened that Jonah himself had to turn back. Jonah himself had to say sorry and repent and, 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 and say to God, OK, I will go where you call me. And then he does. And he's been forgiven. It's OK for him to be forgiven because he deserves it. Maybe that's what Jonah thinks. But he doesn't deserve it. He's done, he's done nothing to deserve it. He's done exactly the same as the Ninevites have done which is to turn back and to say to God, I'm sorry that we turned away from you. I'm coming back now. Jonah's being a hypocrite. He wants them to be treated worse than he was treated. He wants him to be given a clean slate and a fresh start, but they don't deserve it. Jonah loves being comfortable. He makes everything about himself. He's also a hypocrite because he wants them to be treated differently from him. And so God provides this, this plant to sort of point these things out for him. This plant, this, this, this leaf, and then this worm, and then this scorching fire, all of which sort of show him, Jonah, you love it when things work out for you, even though you didn't do anything about it. And God says, you didn't make that plant. You didn't plant it and tend it and make it grow and care for it. It happened to you, and you were glad about it. These people, these people in Nineveh, I made them, and I love them, and I tend them, and I, and I care for them. And when they turn back to me, of course, I want to be kind and forgive them. Of course, I want to be gracious towards them. They matter to me. I, I cared for them. I made them in a way that you never did for that plant. And yet this thing that you never made, you're angry when it's taken away. These people that I did make, I'm overjoyed that they're not going to be taken away, that they're not going to be punished, that they're not going to be destroyed. Come on, Jonah. It's not about you. It's not about whether you're comfortable and you find it easy and you get your way. It's about what's right. It's about what's good. And I can tell you it's good that all of these people are now turned back to me. That's what, that's what Jonah needed to be taught. He needed to be shown how sort of hypocritical he was. How it was that he was having one rule for them and one rule for other people. That's the parable of the leaf, which is the end of the story of Jonah. But you know, it has strong parallels with another parable in the Bible. With another story that's told in the Bible. This is a story that Jesus tells, and it's often known as the, the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal just means someone who spent everything. 
Really, I, th I think it should more be called the parable of the lost sons. Notice I said sons, plural, not just one son, but two, because this story starts off with, with two sons, uh, a father who has two sons and one of them, the, the, the younger son, uh, who is reckless and frivolous and wants to live life to the full. He goes to his father and says, look, I want you to give me my inheritance now. In other words, father, I'm going to treat you as if you're dead. You're dead to me. All I want is your stuff. All I want is your money. So give it to me now. And the father does. The father gives him half of that. How heart-wrenching that must be for the father in that moment to, 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 to be told, look, I don't, I don't care about our relationship. I just care about your stuff. So give it to me now. But he does. And the younger son goes off and he spends it all. He spends everything. That's why he's called the prodigal son. And he, he goes off and he spends it all and, on reckless living on a wild lifestyle and he, and he runs out. And he ends up with nothing and he ends up having to become a servant and he ends up actually in, in, in the lowest possible place. He's in the muck, uh, providing, uh, looking after pigs in a pigsty. That's the job he's ended up getting and he's, he, he's, he's, he's having to eat the same food as the pigs. And, he's, and he decides in that moment, you know what, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to go back and see if my father will have me back. I know I don't deserve to be his son anymore, but maybe he'll take me back as a servant. And so he goes and he, he travels back and before he's even home, the father who's been looking out for him, who's been waiting for him, who's been desiring to welcome him back into his home and, and embrace him and have his son back, is there waiting for him and runs out to greet him. And, and, and this, this son starts, starts rehearsing this speech that he's been saying about, I'm not worthy to be a son in your household, but please have me back and I'll be a servant for you. And the father says, no, none of that. And then I want to read a little bit of, of the end of that parable that Jesus says. But the father said to his servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. See, what's happened is that this son, like Jonah, has run away from his father. Like Jonah ran away from God, he's run away from his father. But when he, when he was willing to turn back, the father embraced him. The father said, you are welcome back. You are, you are free to be part of my family. I'm going to have a party. We're going to have a feast because you're home. And it's actually very similar to the people of Nineveh as well. The people of Nineveh who, who had turned massively away from God and lived in all kinds of ways that weren't right. But as soon as they were willing to turn around, as soon as they were willing to repent, he welcomed them back. So just like Jonah and just like the people of Nineveh, this younger son in this story that Jesus told is welcomed home with open arms and a party ensues. But then we come to the second son, the second lost son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother's come home, he said, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. See, at the end of this story, we get the second son. We get the older son. And he's like Jonah in the bit of the story we've just looked at. Jonah who's saying, it's not fair that you've welcomed them back. It's not fair that you've forgiven them. They don't deserve it. And the father says, it's not about that. See, this, this, this second son or, or this Jonah is saying, what about me? What about me? What about what I deserve? And God to Jonah says, at the minute, it's not about you. At the minute, it's about Nineveh. And this father in the story says to the, younger, to the older son, look, at the moment, it's not about you. It's about the younger son, because whenever anyone turns back to God, it's not about the rest of us. It's about them. It's about what God wants to do to welcome and embrace them. This older son saying, what about me? Surely I matter as your son as well. And the father says, yeah, you do. You've always been here. But at the minute, this other son matters just as much 
And this other son is the one we're going to give our attention to because he was lost and he's back. So these are the two parables that we're looking at today. The parable of the leaf that Jonah lives through. The parable of the two lost sons that Jesus tells. But I think these are parables for today. These are stories for today, for us, for me, because I recognise I'm a lot like Jonah in this story. And actually, I'm a lot like this older son sometimes, more than I'd like to admit. Well, I said earlier on that Jonah likes comfort. I like being comfortable as well. I like being able to be comfortable physically, yes, but I also like to be comfortable in not having my perceptions challenged and not having to welcome people I don't like to welcome and not having to forgive people I don't like to forgive. I'm really good at making it about me, just like Jonah was. I'm really good at making everything about me and about whether, whether I'm happy and about whether it's working out for me. And boy, can I be a hypocrite. I can definitely be like the hypocrite because I can look at other people and think, well, I'm better than them. I can think, hmm, maybe they don't really deserve it. But I didn't deserve it. See, it's really easy for us to read the parable of the the two lost sons and to think of ourselves as the the older son. We're the faithful ones. We're the ones who who never ran away. We're we're, We're the good people. I want to say to you that I believe that all people start off not as the older son, but as the younger son. We've all turned away from God. We've all gone our own way, we've all run, we've all found our own path in the world and we've tried to carve it out and we've been more interested in ourselves and our own comfort. We've treated others differently than we want to be treated ourselves. We've, we've turned away from God and from all the things that are right in lots of different ways. I'm not the older son, I'm the younger son. I'm the one who found myself desperately in need to turn back to God and I did and when I did, he welcomed me. He gave me a place in his family. He said, you're my son. You don't have to be a servant to me. I want you to be a son. You're my heir. I want to give you the inheritance that comes from being part of my family. We all start as the younger son. God longs for us to come back. But we Christians can often have quite short memories about that and start to think of ourselves as as better or superior. Forget how much we needed God. So I want to say to anyone who's a Christian listening to this, anyone who's part of our church or part of any church, can I remind you, it's not about us. It's not about you. And to to anyone who's listening to this who, who wouldn't call themselves a Christian or who isn't part of a church, can I say to you that I'm sorry for the times when we've made this whole faith thing all about us instead of recognizing that actually it's about you. It's about all of us. It's about all of us being able to find those steps towards journeying back to God around finding God again. If we want life to be fair, where everyone gets their just desserts, where when someone does something wrong, they are punished. If we want everything in life to be fair, then we need to be willing for that to apply to us as well. And unless we can say that we've been absolutely perfect, that we've never wandered away from God, that we've never wandered away from where he might want us to be, we don't really want things to be fair. We don't really want things to be punished every time we do something wrong. We want God to be a forgiving God, to be a merciful God, to be a compassionate God. We want God to be like the father in that story with the two sons. We want God to be like the God we see in the story of Jonah, who is willing to forgive Jonah as soon as he turns back to him, who's willing to forgive the people of Nineveh as soon as they turn back to him. We want a lavish, relentlessly pursuing and loving God good news is that's exactly what God is like. If that's the God that you're up for, if that's the God that that you want to meet, then I want to say, look no further than the God we see in the Bible, where there's all these stories of second chances and of grace and of forgiveness and of compassion and love. That's the God that I gave my life to. That's the God that I read of in the Bible and that that I love and that I serve. If you want to find out more about him, please be in touch with us. Sorry for the times when we make it all about us. But today, I want to encourage all of us, no matter where we are on this journey, whether we feel close to God or whether we feel we're running away, whether we've just turned back, wherever we are with him, whether we're actually in the middle of a sulk with God, just like Jonah was, can I encourage us all to look to God, to say, you know what, I'm going to let you be God and I'm going to be me. And just to let that be enough. Can I encourage us all to throw ourselves back on God and his forgiveness and his love and his mercy? It might be that you want to do that for the very first time. It might be that you need to remember again what it is that God did for you and choose to live your life based on that. 
not based on what you can do, not based on how comfortable you are, not based on any of those things. It's time to remember what it is that God has done for us, who he is, and what it means to really follow him. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll hand over back to the guys who are going to lead us again in music. Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for how compassionate you are with the character of Jonah and the people of Nineveh. Thank you for that amazing picture in that parable of two sons of how, how much you desire to throw a party when we come back to you. Thank you that you never leave us, even if we wander from you. Thank you that you're always ready to embrace us again. When we commit to you, when we recommit to you, when we turn to you, when we turn back to you. Lord God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love and your forgiveness. I pray you'd help us to live in light of that, to hold on to it today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
we pray together. Father, thank you that we can turn to you. We don't need to hide away, we can run to you and we are accepted as we are. But thank you God that you love us enough not to just leave us as we are, but you want to bring change in our lives. Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, bring about the change in our lives that you want to bring about. Make us a people that uh, you want us to be. Make us a community in Charlefont St. Peter that you want us to be. Change our community, change our village and the villages and places we live as a result of us meeting with you this morning. May there be an overflow of your grace, your love and truth. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you would like someone to pray with you after the service or at some point during the week, um, just, just after um, the service finishes, there'll be some numbers uh, or a number that you can ring and uh, someone will pray with you or arrange to pray with you and uh, pray alongside you and ask God to help you uh, in the things that you are working through with him. Straight after the service at about 11.15, there are two Zoom calls as we've had over the last few weeks. One of them is for coffee and chat and just connecting with different people. And the other it takes a, a, a kind of deeper look at what God has been saying to us as we've gathered online. The links for both those Zoom calls are at the bottom of this page, but they're also on the info page on goldhill.org. Starting next Sunday, as um, we come out of lockdown more and more, we've got a series called Stepping Out, six uh, tips as it were, six practices, six, six mindsets and, and helpful things as we come out of lockdown and help others come out of lockdown as well. We'll be looking at the book of Joshua, the first five chapters over a six week series. And these are real practical pieces of advice from scripture. It's, um, there'll be things and messages for people who are inside the church, but also there'll be things that will be helpful for people outside of the church. There'll be a message for both. I would really love it for you to encourage friends and neighbours, whether they're churchgoers or not, to tune in or to watch those talks um, at, at a later date. I'm going to pray and bring our time together to a close. I pray that God blesses us as a, 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 as a community and as we follow him in the weeks ahead. 
Father, thank you that you are good and your love is, um, is strong, is big and is everlasting. Thank you, God, that you've called us to be a people of prayer. You've called us to be a people of your word, the Bible. You've called us to be a people obedient to your Holy Spirit. And as we pray and follow you, based on what you are saying in your words, help us to be humble people. Help us to be loving people. Help us to love others as you love them. Help us to pastor our community as well as caring and loving and encouraging and supporting our church family during this time. In Jesus' name, Amen.